Well, good day to you. It is April the 29th. I hope you're having a wonderful day wherever you are. My name is Gary Willing, and as always, I want to welcome you to Search for Signs and point out if you're new. Remind you again if you've heard these videos before that the best thing to do if you want to know more about who and what my tree is, why he's here, you know, about his priorities perhaps, or even if you want to see if there's any truth to it, is to read more about who and what he is, what he's about. You know, see evidence of these miracles. See if it is actually pointing to the fact that the one awaited by all the world's religions is here and so forth. You can see for all that for yourself if you investigate it for yourself. And if you check out the links in the description portion of every one of these videos, they take you to websites that talk about it in some way. So hopefully you'll do that. Now, if this is your first time ever listening to one of these videos and you asked yourself, which one should I listen to first or which, one, which website should I go to first? I would recommend the Share International site. Now, if you um, link is in the description, but if you want to join the discussion, learn more about it that way. You can, of course, learn, I guess, a little bit by posting a comment, but you'll learn a lot more by posting a question. And you can do that by, or asking a question, you can do that by posting your question in the comment section. You can email me at searchforsignsatmail.com. You can even join the discussion on Facebook if that's what you want to do. Now, I always give a shout out to those people who did join the discussion, I want to thank Vanessa Rivera, Mark Hill, Les is more, and Ludovic Santos for your comment. Thank you so much. Now, I had three questions that came my way. They're very different. I'll try to link them together to kind of come up with something that's a little bit has a little bit of continuity. But anyway, I don't know if I can get to the third question or not. I'll at least try to get to the first two. Now, Mark, when I first read your question, you said, "Can you post pics of your Benjamin Crown lithograph?" I'd love to see it. I actually have more than one lithograph, but um, I didn't see the your. So I got thinking about how I'd answer this question because I thought you were just out talking about Benjamin asking questions about his lithographs. Now, I wanted to talk about it in that way. So I'll have to send you a picture of the ones that I have. But anyway, this is one that I do not have. Uh, this is Invocation. I think this is a beautiful piece that he did. Now, Benjamin Krem was an artist. And if you don't know who Benjamin Krem was, because this is your first time ever listening to these videos... He was the one that started talking about these masters of wisdom and Maitreya coming back into the everyday world and devoted his whole life to it. But he was a professional artist. For, and when he was young, before he was talking about Maitreya and the masters of wisdom, that's what he did. That's how he made his living. And his art was very different when he was young to when, it was, when he was older and those kind of things. But it started really changing, if you know anything about Ben, when his master start, he started working with his master in the 50s. And then his art really blossomed. Now, he himself had said, because I actually heard him say this, is that his art is not everybody's cup of tea. And he was very detached on people's uh, reaction or whether they liked his artwork or not, just as he was very detached about people's reaction to what he was saying about Ma Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom. He left it for you to like it or not, or do something with it or not. It wasn't for him to try to convince you. He never tried to convince people or ask, what do you think about my artwork? Do you like my artwork? He wasn't self-indulgent like most artists would be, you know? Now, I, I love this quote from uh, Picasso. He said, good artists borrow, great artists steal, right? <laughs> anyway, but I'll take it a step further in relation to Benjamin Krem's art. The best of artists paint in a way, or create in a way, if it's not painting, that nobody else has done before. And his art is totally unique. And where does it come from? Where did the inspiration behind all his paintings come from? Well, he said it came from his master. And his master had a hand in every one of his paintings, whether it was the design or the color or the idea or the concept of his paintings. But he, when he talked about his paintings, there's an esoteric meaning to every one of his paintings. Now, incidentally, Mark, this is a lithograph of the one that I have. This is the first one that I bought, the chalice. But anyway, it's about the Christ... Uh, principle, the Christ love anyway, but it's supposed to be the looking down on a cup that, but the fire is the love nature of the Christ. But anyway, but when he talked about his own paintings, they were quite, a, it, it really made him alive in a way. And he really went into the inner meaning of what his paintings were about. But the other thing too, that Benjamin Krem did that I found just to be, um, irreplaceable. I mean, I, I mean, just so unique and when he passed away, did not have access to this perspective on art. I feel very, I feel like there's a loss in my life because of it. Because I felt very blessed 
to sit and listen to Benjamin Krem talk about art in a way that nobody talks about. And when he talked about the Renaissance painters, he talked about them in a way that, like I said, nobody ever really talked about. He talked about them from the ageless wisdom perspective, but also from an esoteric point of view. And I've spent enough time in museums, listen to the curators talk about this artist or that artist. You know, I put the little, put my headphones on, press play and walk around to and listen to somebody talk about, you know, this artist and what they're doing. But they usually talk about it in terms of what was going on in their life, to how they painted, to the style, to this and that and the other. He took it to a whole other level. And when he talked about the Renaissance painters like Titian and Paolo Veronese and Rembrandt and Michelangelo and, and those guys, the biggies, you know, he talked about them in a way that you just don't get. And he talked about it at, from, their, from not only their energetic standpoint and how they painted, but also the meaning behind the paintings that they were doing. And every one of the Renaissance painters, according to Benjamin Kramer, are now masters. Some of them have chosen to stay here on this planet, but most of them have gone off to other planets or to the next solar system that we would all go to, Sirius, which is not too far from our own solar system. But anywho, and masters are the only ones that can go there. They don't have average humanity on that in that solar system. It's a quite an extraordinary thing, but he even talked about that and those kind of things. But each one of the Renaissance painters, when they would paint, let's say, a biblical story, they did it from an esoteric standpoint. And when humanity really understands the biblical, the truths of the Bible, but not only, not only that, but also the meaning behind why they painted, and it will have a whole different meaning to, to what you're seeing, right? And like, for instance, um, Rembrandt, who is one of my favorite um, Renaissance painters, he lived, what, about four or five, six hundred years ago, something like that. And when he was painting, he became very well known and then lost everything. He lost, he went bankrupt. Uh, he could, couldn't even give away his paintings, believe it or not. He had a very tumultuous personal life. He had deaths in his life and those kind of things from his, his own wife to his kids and so forth. So he, he had a very very, very tough life. But when he painted his self-portraits and he painted over 80 of them, you see this very calm individual, you know, and, and not stressed, you know, and it's, they're quite extraordinary in that way. But the other thing too is, and Ben let this cat out of the bag when <clears throat> not too long before he stopped coming to do these conferences, he just happened to talk about it, that Rembrandt was actually overshadowed by Maitreya when he painted his um, self-portraits. And at the time that he did it, the masters were thinking that it would be another thousand years before they were able to come back, before humanity would be ready. And so their, their plans changed because we developed the nuclear bomb. And then the masters saw in their future, when they started to look into the future, they could see as a very real future, we would destroy ourselves. So that's why they had to rush and really come into an unprepared humanity. You know, and that's why, you know, we're still in the in the process that we are where nobody is seeing Maitreya on TV, but yet Maitreya is already in the everyday world speaking to humanity in the way in whether it's on TV or the media, giving lectures or those kind of things, but he's already got his foot in that door, right? But when Rembrandt was alive, like I said, they were thinking it would be another thousand years, but he started the process of coming into the everyday world through art. And so what I mean by that is, well, Ben said that um, Re um, Rembrandt, when he was painting these self-portraits, painted in Maitreya's eyes, and it has an energetic quality of Maitreya in his paintings. Quite extraordinary stuff. But every one of these painters have a different quality. Benjamin Krem's paintings had a different quality, but his master had a hand in, in that art too. So the lithographs <clears throat> that... I have, and other people in the Share International groups have bought, and I guess other people have maybe bought. If you stand in front of those lithographs, uh, his master can see you. And you don't have to chant or do any kind of prayer or anything like this. It's just standing in front of the painting. Now, you can't see his master, but it creates a window for his master to see any person standing in front of it because his master had a hand in the creation of that art. And so when Ben was alive he referred to himself as his master's window into the world. 
and when he's passed away, that's right now until we see these masters out into the world and they won't need a window into the world. These lithographs are the are the only way his master really can see any one of us or the best way to see any one of us. It's kind of like the hand of Maitreya to some degree, but his master can um, see you, uh, give you a blessing, give you a healing, that kind of thing, you know. Um, it's, and, it's, and most people use it right before they do their meditation and those kind of things. But anyway... But it's quite an extraordinary piece of art. And this is how he made his living. You know, so even though people accused him of grifting off this information, and that's why he was deceiving people, as they like to, to say, you know, he wasn't deceiving anybody. He was being real and truthful about what he, his own experiences and those kind of things about this information, very detached in that way, very relaxed about your view, whether you like it or not. But also, but this is the way that he made his money, you know, was through his art and through his lithographs. And uh, I find them to be quite beautiful pieces of art, but I also use it too to have his master be able to send a healing through me or to me or a blessing in that kind of way too. So, but anyway, but uh, I will put a link in the uh, description for the, uh, the website that you can go to to see all the prints that are available and that kind of thing. I'll even put a link in the description for the Benjamin Krem Museum if you want um, because there's actually a museum out in, in Southern California where you can see the original pieces of his artwork. So not just lithographs. So anyway, quite extraordinary thing. But anyway, thank you very much for the question that I misread to give us a quick time to talk about not only Ben's paintings, but art. Oh, the other thing I was going to say too about the art of the future. If you read or if you just listen to um, the ones that I've read so far, uh, the Benjamin Crumb's Master, there's one about sharing. I want to talk about that one and also the art of living. I've read that one a few times. Um, but you'd have to go back and really look at it and, and find that video. But anyway, the art of living <clears throat> is about the creativity in the lives of humanity in the future. Where right now, most people just see themselves as a person. They either think themselves as an artist or not or whatever. But really, his, the masters will tell you that latent within the hearts of all of humanity is this creativity, is this joy that these masters share, that we all share, is that truth of of who we what we are the masters will light that up in humanity but just by us seeing them and and being able to interact with them and experience their love and wisdom and emulate them we'll start to awaken that creativity within our own hearts but they say that every single person person without exception has that creative fire within their hearts it's just we don't realize that we do have it so most people see themselves as worker bees, perhaps, or trying to get ahead and competing against other people and missing out the, of the real truth of life, which is we are all creative beings. And then there are millions of people who are literally starving to death, watching their family starve to death because there's not enough food for them to live. And that's all they can think about is, is getting another meal. They've lost all chance of being creative because of their the ability, they're, they're literally starving to death. And th- when it comes to sharing... Right now, the reason why I'm only focused on nations sharing of resources is because that's the first thing that we have to do. But sharing will transform in the future to not only nations giving of their resources, but each and every one of us giving of our creative efforts to humanity, whether it's technological advances or innovations or inventions, but even the own art that we come up with, we shared with all of humanity as freely. We'll all be able to experience the art of humanity in that way, and it will set off a renaissance in the people's in people's lives but we'll even have creative we'll create our own lives and in, in how we live and what we'll do and it will be done in an artistic way not just this haphazard way as it is today we'll be in true cr- control and creative creativity of our own lives now the art of the future versus the art of today one of these masters compared it to the building of the Sistine Chapel as the art of the future to a child playing with building blocks in their room. That's the difference. Where art today, music today, is nothing compared to what it's going to be in the future. So when I talk about Maitreya's core teaching, without sharing there will be no justice, without justice there will be no peace, and without peace there will be no future... I talk about the historical evidence that that's true with the Marshall Plan. You can investigate it for yourself. But I also want to say that sharing is not only about nations giving other resources. It's about the creativity of humanity given freely to to all of humanity in the future. But also the future in which we live, 
you know, that peace bringing us a future is not a future of more of the same, more of the same problems. It's a future of the promise of revealed divinity, as his master put it. Quite extraordinary. We can only just can't even imagine what that's going to be like. So anyway, I uh, thank you for the, the question. To, <laughs> even though I misread it, I thank you for the question uh, nonetheless. And I'll send you a couple pictures of, of some of the lithos that I have. Now, the other question you had, Mark, is about the animal kingdom. You said, hey, Gary, I've got another question. Has Maitreya ever spoken about the future of the animal kingdom? Well, Maitreya, not necessarily, but a couple of the masters have. And the animal kingdom's future is about evolving just as, as the human kingdom is. All kingdoms are evolving. And we as a humanity are ignorant of the kingdoms above us, but we're also ignorant of the fact that we are all one. So we <clears throat> are not living life with right human relationships. So Maitreya's job is to teach humanity right human relationships. Really, that's the basic essence of it. You, know, you can't do that without the principle of sharing. You can't do that without peace. You can't do that without seeing yourselves as one with other people and those kind of things. Living harmlessly and those kind of things within the law of cause and effect. That's the only way to do it. So the way that we live life now is not that way. So we harm each other. We harm the environment. We harm animals. We harm, you know, that we harm ourselves, you know, and those kind of things. And so the relationship with humanity and animals in the future will, of course, change because we will, we will not harm them in the way that we're harming them today. Now, there is another part of the reason why we are harming them, and that's their karma. According to the master's the reason why there's a lot of animal experiment, experimentation, the reason why fish are being killed off in the way that they are, the reason why we breed these animals just to you know, eat them and slaughter them in the way that we're doing is actually they're paying off their karmic debt to humanity because when humanity just was starting out, they were the dinosaurs that were decimating humanity. And they still have a little bit left to repay, I guess, from what the masters have said. But eventually it will be repaid and... We won't kill them in that way. Hopefully they won't kill us either. <laughs> but the, the thing about animals is, is really, you know, the, they are good examples of evolution, I guess is what I'm trying to say. If you look at the highest of all animals, those would be the domesticated animals, animals that can respond to human thought. Dogs, cats, um, camels, oxen. Elephants and, and horses, I think, are the, is the lot of them. But any animal that can respond to a human thought, be trained in that way and those kind of things for a purpose or for whatever it is, they are the highest of all animals, where other animals that don't respond to human thought are not as evolved as those animals. So there, there are clear examples of that life is evolutionary. And then if you look at the plant kingdom, or the vegetable kingdom, the highest of all vegetable kingdom, or the plants, are the floral plants that emit an odor or flowers or those kind of things. And then the highest of all minerals are not crystals like most new age people would think. They're actually the radioactive elements. So you don't want to put those around your neck. <laughs> but those are the highest of all, of, of all minerals. And then if you look at humanity, the highest of all humanity are the disciples of these masters that are just got their foot in the door of the next kingdom. So when they do what they do, it has much more impact on their time and into the future than would average humanity be. So you look at people like Jesus, Leonardo da Vinci, Mohammed, um, Krishnamurti, Krishna, um, and those kind of people, and the Renaissance painters, Mozart, Beethoven, they were all disciples of these masters. And if you look at their work and what they did and how they did it, Abraham Lincoln, another example, you know, um, and the list goes on and on and on. They're, they impacted their time. They did more than the average humanity. We know more about them than, let's say, the average humanity at that time, right? The average person we don't know anything about. We know about Abraham Lincoln. We know about Jesus. We know about his disciples and those kind of things because they were the, the most advanced of all humanity at that time. And today is no different. But they emit a spiritual light. And that's why when people go to the Louvre, to see a very tiny painting, it's rather dull, of the Mona Lisa, and they're drawn into it like a moth to a flame. It's because it's emitting a spiritual light, because Leonardo da Vinci was nearly a master when he painted it. And so he couldn't help but paint 
in that spiritual light. And so we, we, it, it brings out our own soul's quality when we stand in front of it. That's why people just look in awe of this, like I said, rather dull painting, if you think about it, (laughs) of this kind of a half-baked smile and that's about it. You know, it's nothing, you know, extraordinary in terms of that regard. It's just extraordinary by who painted it. You know what I mean? Just as the words that Jesus spoke were very simple, but yet still impact life and humanity today. And how many people have said the words that Jesus said? Did it have the same impact on the on the world around them? No. It was who Jesus was that it, that had that kind of impact. It was the light behind what he was saying that had an impact. But the promise of humanity is that we will all start to emit that same light. That's what we're all evolving to. So hopefully that adds a little bit more insight into it. But that's what, but the relation, like I said, again, again, get swing back around to the animal kingdom. The relationship between humanity and the animal kingdom will change because we will start to see them, we'll see ourselves as one. And then we'll start to, hey, we shouldn't harm animals like we're doing today. And if you want examples of harmlessness, what true harmlessness is, if you look at the Space Brothers who occupy the UFOs, they create crop patterns. They used to call them crop circles, but now they're quite extraordinary patterns. They never uh, harm the wheat or the corn. They're all, all the stocks are bent down gently, but it doesn't harm the actual plant. That's how harmless the Space Brothers are. That's how harmless these masters are. They don't harm anybody. And so we will learn from them what it means to truly be harmless in that way. And then we won't harm animals. We won't harm each other. We won't harm the environment, of course. We won't harm plants. It will it'll transform life on this planet. But anyway, good questions. And then the third question is totally different it's about politics. I'll have to come back and circle around and and do a video on that one. Anyway, I love you guys. Thank you very much for the questions, guys, and the comments. I look forward to putting up videos in the future. You guys have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Remember to take action and help SOP save our planet. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to talking to you again in future videos.